Hi guys, I'm Ashwin. Welcome to a, another edition to the Rapid Review Series. Today we're going to be covering the basic pathologies of the heart. So let's jump straight into it. Um, that's what are we going to be covering today? Uh, arrhythmias, heart failure, cardiomyopathies, the three different types of cardiomyopathies, um, heart valve disease, mainly uh, the different causes and the different clinical manifestations they can have. Um, shock and the different types of shock that we have, ischemic injury, inflammation, and to finish things off, uh, and many different types of congenital heart defects that we can have. So starting off with uh, arrhythmias. So the definition of an arrhythmia is, a, is, is when there's an electrophysiological abnormality arising from the impairment of an electrical signal. Uh, this leads to the normal loss of the, uh, so a loss of the normal rhythm. So the normal rhythm itself is the sinus rhythm set by the SA node, as we know. And the normal sinus rhythm is around 60 to 100 beats per minute. So the different kinds of arrhythmias that we can have, uh, bradyarrhythmia, tachyarrhythmia, that the changes in the normal, the normal sinus rhythm. So bradyarrhythmia is anything below 60 beats per minute, tachyarrhythmia, anything above 60 beats per minute. Um, and uh, the... I think the most important thing about arrhythmias is, is, ha, is literally classification. So arrhythmias actually arise from a bunch of different um, abnormalities. They can be pacemaker abnormalities um, or abnormal conduction pathways or certain conduction blocks or ectopic impulse formations. Um, they're the different uh, reasons for why we have arrhythmias in the first place. But the most important thing about arrhythmias is the classification itself. So the two main classifications are bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias. And then obviously there's, in positional wise, uh, you can have supraventricular and ventricular tachyarrhythmias. Um, one thing to note about supraventricular ventricular arrhythmias is that they have, usually they have a regular QRS complex. We'll get into the specifics later. And then with ventricular arrhythmias, there are wide QRS complexes. Okay, so the different kind of bradyarrhythmias that we can have. Um, number one, sinus bradyarrhythmia. This is quite simple. This is just the decreased automaticity due to increased vagal tone. So um, the, the vagus number, uh, vagus nerve innervating the heart is um, causing there to be an increased parasympathetic nervous system effect causing a decreased heart rate. So the sinus bradyarrhythmia. But the thing is the difference between brady uh, bradycardia, which is normal, and bradyarrhythmias, which is pathological, sinus bradyarrhythmias, it's decreased automaticity, it's not supposed to be happening. And uh, number two um, is atrioventricular block. Um, this is usually due to an inferior wall myocardial infarction or a fibrosis. So that's what it's mostly caused by. Um, but there's the three different types of blocks that we can have, these AV blocks. Um, the first degree AV block is when the PR interval actually exceeds more than 200 milliseconds. That's an important uh, number to remember. This is the singular definition of the first degree AV block that we need to know. Um, and second, different, second degree AV block is when there's a progressive lengthening, progressive lengthening of the PR interval until there's a drop of the QRS complex. So we'll look at some uh, ECGs in the next slide and I'll explain what that means. Um, and then the third degree heart block is when there's a complete block. And so there's no relationship whatsoever between the P waves and the QRS complexes. Uh, Finishing this off, um, another type of bradyarrhythm is sinus arrest. So that's when there's completely, there's like uh, the cart completely stops and, and it's usually due to some underlying cardiovascular disease. So here's a, uh, a picture of the different um, AV blocks. First, we have the First degree heart block, it's pretty simple. There's a prolonged PR interval, as you can see, prolonged PR interval. Uh, and one thing I should mention is when there's a secondary heart block, second degree heart block, there's two types. One is the Mobitz one, and the second is Mobitz two. The difference between the two, and I mentioned before, a secondary heart block is a progressive lengthening of the PR interval until the QRS complex completely disappears. So here it is, the PR interval, Kind of short there, larger, even larger. And then here, the QRS complex is completely missing. Whereas in Mobitz 2, 
it doesn't, there is no progressive lengthening. You can see PR interval same, PR interval same, PR interval same, but there is a QRS complex missing. So that's the difference between MOBIS one and MOBIS two. And then and, um, this variation of the second degree, the second degree heart block here is when we have, uh, is the two to one ratio heart block, um, AV block even. Um, as you can see here, um, a P wave, no QRS complex, a P wave, and then a QRS complex. So we need two P waves for every QRS complex. That's why there's a two to one ratio. Again here, two to one PRS com QRS complex. So two to one ratio. And then of course, the third degree heart block, there's just no communication between the atrial depolarization and the ventricular depolarization whatsoever, because there is uh, no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complex. So it's complete block between the SA node and the AV node. Okay, and then tachyarrhythmias. Um, two important uh, subsections of the tachyarrhythmias are the supraventricular and ventricular. Like I mentioned before, supraventricular usually narrow QRS complex and ventricular arrhythmias usually wide QRS complex. Um, the different kinds of uh, supraventricular arrhythmias. Like I said, guys, with arrhythmias, classification is highly important. They all have very similar causes. Um, and I've listed a couple of causes for different ones. Um, but what's most key here is the classification of each arrhythmia. So once we put classification down, um, this kind of question becomes a little bit easier to understand. Um, so supraventricular arrhythmias, narrow QRS complex, these are the different kinds we have. Um, like with sinus bradycardia, there's also sinus tachycardia, or there's increased automaticity this time due to increased uh, sympathetic nervous system tone. Um, atrial flutter, obviously, when we have, uh, it's classified by 250 to 350 beats per minute. And on an ECG, you can see a sawtooth appearance. Looks like a sawtooth on the ECG. Um, atrial fibrillation, 350 to 450 beats per minute, and it's just a completely irregular, um, irregular rhythm. Uh, the important thing to remember is the irregularity of the rhythm is also irregular. So there's no uh, pattern to the madness, if you will. So the re irregular rhythm is also irregular. Finally, atrial tachycardia, 150 to 250 beats per minute. Um, there's two subsections to this as well. Uh, one is a focal atrial tachycardia and a multifocal atrial tachycardia. So the difference between the two obviously being one section where there's an ectopic um, excitation and then multifocal is when there's lots of locations where there's ectopic uh, depolarization occurring. Um, I, I think I forgot to mention supraventricular, obviously, uh, by definite, by the word, it's uh, above anything. So it includes the SA and AV node. And anything below the AV node in the conduction system uh, includes is included in the ventricular arrhythmias. Go back to, OK, uh, number fifth one is the paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. This includes the accessory pathways. And the two such extents we have here are the um, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia and atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. Obviously, this one is, involves the AV node, and this one doesn't. But what's important to remember here is that they have accessory pathways. So, when there are more than when there's more than one pathway, and each pathway has a different refractory period, one can become excited, and it causes a reentry circuit. So. Um, you could have two circuits and then one can have a re-entry one when one is in the refractory period and one comes out of it um when the when when there's a wave of excitation it could cause a re-entry uh, impulse causing there to be a um a paroxysmal superventricular tachycardia um uh, with the ventricular arrhythmias that cause, a, again, a wide QRS complex, uh, we have these four types. We have the premature ventricular arrhythmias that, a, uh, that are due to like um, ectopic beats originating from ventricular focus, and they are not preceded by a P wave um, because obviously they're premature, so they're not occurring before the... Uh, sorry, they are premature, so that's why they're not occurring 
uh, before uh, before a period. Um, uh, ventricular tachycardia can be mono or polymorphic, and a type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is the Tassar's de points, um, which has which is uh, distinguishes itself by a long QT interval. And then finally, we have the ventricular fibrillation, when there's a complete indiscernible QRS complex and is characterized by three, uh, more than 300, 300 beats per minute. Okay, so heart failure. So let's begin with um, definition of heart failure, which is the inability of the heart to meet the metabolic requirements of, uh, of the tissues for the oxygen, um, of the tissues for oxygen even. Um, there's two types of heart failure, systolic and diastolic. Both lead to congestion of blood in the lungs. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the difference between the two is that the fact that systolic heart failure can't pump, pump enough. So it doesn't pump enough blood, whereas diastolic heart failure is about not filling, not filling up the heart with enough blood. So in systolic heart failure, obviously, there's low cardiac output. And as you remember from the physio um, heart physiology, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll speak about that further later, but basically um, in systolic heart failure, there's low cardiac output and the ejection fraction is a lo lower than 40%. Um, it should usually be around 50 to 70% because the ejection fraction is of course, uh, stroke volume divided by the total volume. Um, the end diastolic volume even. Uh, so it should be around 50 to 70%, but in systolic heart failure, ejection fraction is less than 40%. Um, and then obviously systolic heart failure is due to some contractile impairment or some, or and or increased afterload. And uh, with diastolic heart failure, which again is about not filling up with enough blood. Uh, sorry, this should say normal EF, which is, it has a normal ejection fraction but a reduced preload. So it's not filling up with enough blood, so there's a reduced preload. Um, and it's due to restrictive or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we'll get into cardiomyopathy a little bit later, but uh, this is uh, diastolic heart failure is usually caused by these two types of myopathies. So we have here systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure, not being able to fill up with enough blood, whereas this is a pumping problem. As you can see, a pumping problem. It's the inability of the heart to contract enough so the blood, the blood, flow, the cardiac output is lower. Whereas here in uh, diastolic heart failure, there's less blood filling up in the ventricles. Uh, so core pulmonale, what is core pulmonale? It's the right-sided heart failure that results from pulmonary hypertension or primary lung disease. And these are the three main symptoms of core pulmonale. Um, usually as a result of right-sided heart failure. So symptoms are, it's the backing off of the blood basically. So the more and more blood that gets backed up but due to pulmonary hypertension back into the right side of the heart, these are the symptoms that we see on the human body. So we see the jugular veins distending, uh, we see peripheral edema and hepatomegaly. This is really important. It shows up in clinical manifestations all the time uh, in cardiology. And so, yeah, these are the three, three uh, main symptoms to know for COVID. So any and all kinds of these uh, lung disorders, such as um, COPD or um, blood clots in the lungs or respiratory distress syndrome, um, all of these can cause a hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So there's not enough gas exchange being happening. So there's pulmonary vasoconstriction going on. And this backup of the blood leads to resistance in the pulmonary circulation of over 25 millimeters of mercury, thus causing pulmonary hypertension. And this in turn backs up the blood into the right ventricles, causing hy concentric hypertrophy, um, which is um, uh, which is when the, there's an increased thickness, whereas eccentric hypertrophy would, that would, would be when there's an increase in change of a chamber volume. So this concentric hypertrophy, there's an increased thickness leading to diastolic heart failure. Okay, so now uh, cardiomyopathies. Um, what you need to know about cardiomyopathies is that um, obviously they're myocardial diseases that result in cardiac dysfunction, but there's the three types. 
there's dilated hypertrophic and restrictive cardiomyopathies. Dilated cardiomyopathies are manifest as a wide QRS complex resulting in systolic heart failure, whereas hypertrophic cardiomyopathies manifest as bigger QRS complex. I'll explain what each one um, further in, in, in the diagram in the next slide, but basically these two cardiomyopathies, they cause diastolic heart failure and restrictive cardiomyopathies uh, will cause a smaller QRS complex. So as you can see here on the diagram, a normal heart, a hypertrophic, a hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, um, a restrictive cardiomyopathy, and then a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, in dilated cardiomyopathy, it's uh, obviously characterized by not just the left ventricle, but sometimes also um, characterized by both ventricles, dilation of both ventricles. Um, there's an inability to contract, which is why it's, it causes a systolic heart failure. So there's uh, a reduced cardiac output. It may be primary or it may be secondary. So primary is like usually idiopathic, uh, whereas secondary, like uh, there's exogenous factors such as like um, bacteria or nutrition or certain drugs that may cause uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, one example that springs to mind is uh, uh, he, uh, hemochromatosis. So um, it usually starts off as a restrictive cardiomyopathy, but then eventually enough iron deposits um, onto, the, onto the ventricle, causing there to be like free, free radical damage to the mitochondria, uh, which then initiates to a point where there's dilated cardiomyopathy. So there's a decreased cardiac output, thus causing systolic heart failure. And so in restrictive cardiomyopathy, however, uh, there's a decreased cardiomyocyte compliance. And this is usually due to um, certain infiltrations of like um, non-contractile um, inelastic materials, such as like misfolded proteins in the case of amyloidosis, um, granulomas, and uh, certain fibrous tissue and fibroelastosis. And all of these can kind of, um, decrease the cardiomyocyte compliance. So there won't be enough filling, which is why it's, uh, it causes a um, diastolic heart failure because it doesn't fill up with enough blood. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, obviously the heart is hypercontractile. There's an increased stroke volume, but the increased mass, however, presents there to be a normal diastolic filling, which is why it's a diastolic heart failure, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, so now heart valve diseases. So um, with heart valve diseases, uh, so obviously the heart has four valves, uh, the tricuspid pulmonary, uh, tricuspid pulmonary aortic and mitral valve, they prevent the backflow of blood. However, there's uh, two types of lesions that they can have. They can have stenosis or regurgitation. I've got here the main different causes of each of the um, valves problem. So you can have um, with mitral valve, as an example, stenosis would usually be caused by rheumatic fever. And as a general rule of thumb, um, acute rheumatic fever would cause a regurgitation of valves, whereas a chronic rheumatic fever would cause a stenosis of the valve. As a general rule of thumb, that's, the, uh, that's what you need to remember about um, uh, heart valve diseases. But um, stenosis is when there's a decreased orifice, whereas uh, regurgitation is when there's backflow, backflow occurring. So the function, uh, that's how each uh, problem, each pathology of the valve can differ. Um, these are the clinical manifestations. I think this is a lot more important than the previous uh, table. Um, obviously, we have here, um, with uh, different valves, st what stenosis and regurgitation can do to each valve. With mitral valve, um, stenosis of the mitral valve, uh, the systolic murmur with a decrescendo. And what I mean by a tympanic S1 is that it's like a, it's like a drum noise, almost a louder S1. Uh, whereas regurgitation, hollow systolic murmur and a quiet S1. And yeah, I, I won't read out each one, uh, but I think it's a really nice table to have. This is the table that I used to study for my final. Um, it's from AMBOSS, so it's a very nice table. It's a nice summary of the clinical manifestations of each valve. Okay, now shock. Uh, 
so with shock, the definition being uh, circulatory failure of the whole body, there's a hyperperfusion of the organs and insufficient oxygen supply. Uh, there's three main types. Um, there's the cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and distributive. Uh, with cardiogenic shock, uh, this decreased cardiac output. It happens when there's injury or obstruction preventing the heart from pumping efficiently. So there's a decreased stroke volume and therefore a decreased cardiac output. Um, this results to obviously uh, hyperperfusion of the lungs and insufficient oxygen supply and tissue hypoxia. Um, and it occurs from, from many causes. It could occur from arrhythmias or like myocardial infarctions, which we'll get onto later. And anything that, that causes damage to the heart of more than 50% of the heart, there's a cardiogenic shock. And so with hypovolemic um, shock is when there's a low fluid volume of the blood. So it's induced by, uh, it can be like hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic, non-hemorrhagic being dehydration. So anything that leads to a loss of 20% of the total blood volume, which is around uh, one liter, uh, this can be enough to induce hypovolemic shock. So anything that, you know, decreased blood volume results to, um, there being a uh, smaller venous return and a smaller venous return therefore means a smaller stroke volume and a smaller stroke volume therefore means a lower cardiac output. Uh, we'll get on to the equations I'll explain further in a minute but uh, the last being distributive um, cardiogenic shock is when there's excessive arterial vasodilation um, so there's like an increased leakage from these vessels and as these vessels widen the resistance to the flow decreases and so there's a, there's a decreased blood pressure therefore decreased perfusion to the lung uh, to the organs and um, insufficient oxygen supply uh, the three types of distributive shock that we have are septic anaphylactic and neurogenic um, and a septic shock these endotoxins from the pathogens uh, they activate the inflammatory pathway that results in a, uh, in a, um, a, a more vascular, uh, higher vascular permeability, which is why we have an increased perfusion. And an anaphylactic shock is uh, similar. It's, uh, it's an allergic reaction. So the mast cells, um, they, they release histamine and they cause vasodilation, thus decreasing blood pressure. Uh, and then uh, neurogenic shock is when there's a damage to the nervous system and therefore it causes a decreased blood pressure. Uh, one thing that's important to mention is that um, cardiogenic shock, like with hypovolemic shock, um, because there's a reduction in cardiac output, uh, this leads to, uh, of, of course, decreased blood flow to the skin. And so the skin gets cold and clammy. So these two are known as cold shocks, whereas this is not the case with distributive um, uh, distributive shock because in contrast with the other two types of shock, distributive shock, uh, the mixed venous oxygen saturation is actually normal and, uh, and the flow in the peripheral vessels is fine. So the, the skin actually is warm and is effused. So it's actually not a cold shock, it's a warm shock. Um, as you can see here, this is a picture from taken from osmosis and an osmosis video. Um, this is describing uh, these. This is the, these are the equations that I was talking about. So blood pressure equals resistance to flow times cardiac output. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, and stroke volume equals end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So in cardiogenic shock, where we have a decreased stroke volume due to uh, many different reasons, uh, we have a decreased cardiac output, which then causes a decreased blood pressure which causes a decreased blood perfusion to our, our, to our tissues. Um, whereas in um, hypovolemic shock, there is a, a smaller uh, venous return because there isn't much volume in the blood. So there's a decreased end diastolic volume, therefore meaning a smaller stroke volume, smaller cardiac output, smaller blood pressure. And then finally, in distributive, sh distributive shock, um, the the resistance to flow is much smaller. Therefore, blood pressure is much smaller because in distributive shock, as you remember, there's an excessive arterial vasodilation, thus decreasing the resistance to flow. That's why blood pressure is much smaller in distributive shock.
So in uh, ischemic injury, we have um, angina pectoris as the stable, unstable, and vasospastic types. But it's basically the it manifests as the pain behind the sternum is caused by cardiac ischemia. Obviously, ischemia is the circulatory imbalance that interrupts blood flow, and so there's decreased uh, oxygen supply, as we know. Um, with but with the stable uh, angina pectoris, um, there's it occurs in regular time intervals. That's the difference between stable and unstable. So stable, it occurs in regular time intervals and it occurs when atheromas cover most of the artery diameter, but not all of it. Uh, whereas an unstable one, it can appear even at rest. And it's a lot more, it's, it's, a, it's a lot worse. It's increased intensity and it's a lot irregular. Um, as And stable anginas are also relieved with rests, whereas unstable anginas, they're not. They can be treated with nitroglycerin, and, and so that's causing vasodilation. Uh, but the pain itself is a result of the uh, adenosine and the bradykinin uh, being released during my myocardial infarction. Um, and then the third type is the vasospastic or the prismantle. Uh, it's usually due to a spasm constricting the artery. So it might be at rest or it might be in a circadian manner. Um, and myocardial infarction, which is the main aspect of uh, uh, this section. Uh, so in a myocardial infarction, um, it's, it's caused obviously by an occlusion of the coronary artery by either a thrombus or an erupted atheroma. Uh, the, two types, uh, the two types that we need to know um, are uh, so some subendocardial myocardial infarction, uh, which causes which is manifested in, as an ST depression, whereas a transneural myocardial infarction is manifests on an ECG as an ST elevation. So we have here when it's subendocardial. So um, as you can see here, it's not it's not the whole thing. It's not transneural, it causes an ST depression, whereas transneural, where it involves the entire entire layer of the myocardium, ST elevation. In uh, inflammation, uh, there's these four types. We have pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, endocarditis, and myocarditis. Uh, it's cardiac tamponade is not really a type, but I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so pericarditis um, is the inflammation of the pericardium, of course. Um, these are the causes. It can be idiopathic, viral infection, such as the Coxsackie B virus, and um, certain autoimmune diseases, and it usually manifests as a um, sharp retrosternal chest pain. So upon inhalation, the lungs expand, putting pressure on the heart, and the pain radiates to the neck, shoulders, and the back. And it's usually, it's usually much worse when you're lying on your back, this kind of pain. Um, with the uh, cardiac tamponade, however, um, this is simply when the cardiac chambers cannot fill with the blood properly, and this is due to pericardial, uh, pericardial effusion. What I mean by that is, um, so when um, there's a rapid fluid accumulation occurring in the pericardial cavity, um, this compresses the cardiac chambers and the atrial walls. So um, it can be caused by uh, pericarditis, which in fact leads to pericard pericardial effusion. And the pericardial sac, which usually contains around 50 milliliters of uh, liquid, of thin, you know, the thin clear liquid that usually exists in the pericardial sac, during chronic cardiac enlargement, the fluid accumulation um, can go up to around 500 milliliters. So that would be an, that would be an issue because it compresses on the cardiac chambers, decreasing the, um, its uh, ability to function. Whereas, um, and also the main uh, symptoms of cardiac tamponade is obviously Beck's triad, um, which is a triad of three symptoms, um, the, the distended jugular vein, hypotension, and muffled heart sounds, which is important to remember those three symptoms. The Beck's triad is the main symptom of cardiac tamponade. Okay, and uh, with endocarditis, uh, obviously, it's the inflammation of the innermost layer, the inner, uh, the endocardium, um, and it's usually due to bacterial infections. 
uh, are obviously the main symptoms are fever, murmur, and septo uh, septic emboli. Um, the kind of bacteria that's most commonly causing endocarditis is obviously um, the strep virulence, which is a sub, which causes subacute endocarditis. It's the most common one, but it's not very virulent, and so it doesn't destroy the valves. Um, but it usually infects previously damaged valves that um, you know that have exposed endothelial subendothelial collagen. Um, and uh, the last being myocarditis. Um, inflammation of the myocardium, of course, which is the middle muscular layer. Uh, and so it causes swelling and, and damages the ability of the heart to contract and pump blood. Uh, in fact, in severe cases, it can actually lead to heart failure. Uh, and so if the, but if the inflammation is treated, the myocardium can, of course, reverse. Um, it can complicate, however, if there's a severe myocardial inflammation leading to fibrosis or scar tissue, which causes long-term damage to the heart. Uh, it's usually caused by certain infections like viral infections like Coxsackie B virus uh, or certain parasites. Um, but the most common uh, kind of infection is the bacterial infection, which is the Lyme's disease by the uh, Borrelia burgdorferi that can cause uh, myocarditis. Uh, congenital heart defects. So with congenital heart defects, um, these defects usually arise in like the fourth to the seventh week of the gestational period, and they usually a mixture of genetic and environmental influences. So I have five here. Uh, the first one being abnormal shunting of the blood. Um, so this is the main aspect of the congenital heart defects is the fact that um, most of these cause an abnormal shunting of the blood. Uh, it can either be from the arterial to the venous system, so from uh, left to right, or from the venous to the arterial system, so right to left. And it's determined by the presence, position, and size of the abnormal opening. So it depends. So we'll get onto that later. Is this, are these septal defects? So whatever opening um, there is, the, um, it depends on its position. It depends on its size. Uh, yeah, it depends where it is. But essentially, blood is usually moving away uh, from a higher region of pressure to a lower region of pressure. So if there's a higher pulmonary vascular resistance, it means blood is moving from the right side of the heart to the left side. However, if the pulmonary resistance falls below the systemic circulation, um, there's a left to right shunt, obviously. And so um, anything that can kind of compromise the oxygenation of blood is, is known as an acyanotic uh, shunt. Um, which is which, which is where um, blood is being shifted from the left to the right side, right, left to the right side. Uh, whereas it, uh, oxygenated blood is shifted um, when oxygenated blood is being shunted to the deoxygenated side. It usually uh, it's eventually getting oxygenated, so there's no cyanosis occurring. Um, it leads to uh, this can in fact lead to you know heart, right heart hypertrophy. Um, and, and there's different, obviously different causes like the septal defects that can cause these uh, abnormal shuntings of the blood. Um, there's also the distribution, disruption of the pulmonary blood flow, obviously decreased blood flow by the stenosis. So leading to fatigue and dyspnea, where, um, whereas an increase in blood flow would stimulate uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction. Um, but yeah, some of these defects can close spontaneously uh, and they're pretty asymptomatic um, but in more severe cases obviously it would lead to cyanosis fatigue and respiratory failure um, third of uh, third is patent ductus arteriosus so normally uh, it should close around two days after birth and blood shifts from the left higher systemic pressure to the right lower pulmonary pressure so the murmurs are detected and they continue through systole and diastole. And um, this leads to left heart hypertrophy and a widened pulse pressure, uh, which is obviously diagnosed with like um, a radiograph or something. Um, and then the two types of septal defects that we have are atrial and ventricular septal defects. 
Um, they vary from like small asymptomatic op openings or like really large symptomatic openings that can usually cause um, a left to right shunting and a dilation of the heart chambers. Uh, and uh, finally, in Tetralogy of Fallot, there are four defects in total. There's the ventricular septal defects, as pictured here, um, the ventricular septal defect, pulmonary valve stenosis, as you can see here, pulmonary valve stenosis, uh, the right ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, and the dextraposition of the aorta, which basically means the aorta overriding the ventricular septal defect. And um, yeah, so together they can cause um, cyanosis because they usually cause a right to left shunt. So there's a hypocyanotic, um, it's definitely a, 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 it can cause cyanosis, fatigue and respiratory failure. So yeah, these are the sources that I used for the images. And uh, thank you for paying attention. I um, hope it was useful. Uh, if so, let us know using the feedback uh, linked in the description or using this QR code. It'll be really helpful for us to know how we can improve on these lectures and uh, hopefully these rapid review lectures are uh, well worth your time. So yeah, thank you again and see you all later.